I wanted to ask you, have you ever seen, and it's one of my favorite movies ever. I'm going back to the movies. This one is incredible. Have you seen Braveheart? Raise your hand if you've seen Braveheart. Three of you? It's about a guy with a brave heart. <laughs> it, it's a war movie of sorts. Let me tell you what it is about. And fellas, let me tell you something. It's, it's totally okay to cry if you watch Braveheart. It's totally okay to cry. So the story of Braveheart is the story of a man named William Wallace. And he was a real guy. And what he did is he fought for Scotland to defend against English tyranny. The English did all kinds of terrible things to the Scots, and William Wallace helped lead an uprising to fight against them. And actually, I've been to the town where they killed William Wallace in York, but there's a great line in that movie, in the movie Braveheart, and the line goes like this. Wallace at one point says, every man dies, but not every man truly lives. And what he's talking about there is that not everyone truly gets to experience the true life. And you know what's interesting is Christianity teaches something super close to that. That the only way to really live is to be willing to give up your life for Christ. To die to flesh, to die to self. So the question that we're dancing around tonight is, would you be willing to give up your life for Christ? Because this is the reality that the early church had to face. This is their reality. They had to face such hardships. And you think about it today, at church today, we're just begging people to show up. We're just begging people to come. And then we argue about what color the carpet should be. We argue if we should have coffee or not. But in the early church, people were dying for being Christian. Also, you know, they weren't dying because Rome said you couldn't believe in other gods. Because Rome didn't care. Do you know why Rome killed Christians? It's because of this. Because Christians say that Jesus is Lord. And the Romans would say, you can't say that. Caesar is Lord. And the Christians would say, Jesus is Lord. And that's why the Romans killed them. And do you know what the Romans did? The Romans fed Christians to lions in the Colosseum. Nero, who was an emperor of Rome, used to take Christians and he would tie them to this big old stake in his courtyard, and he would put this, like, wax on them, this really thick wax, and he would light them on fire. And he would make Christians, he would literally make Christians candles to light his parties. This is what the early church had to face. So what about you? Because they were willing to die for what they believe. Are you? Are you willing to die for what you believe? And so as we go through this text tonight, imagine this. Imagine sitting down and having a conversation with Jesus. And in the conversation, Jesus asked, would you be willing to die on an electric chair for me? What is your answer? And with that, let's look at Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 24, continuing in our series in Matthew. And so Matthew 16, 24, it says this, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of the Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we ask that we would be able to be disciples who are willing to die to self and to live for you. Lord, you say that your burden is light, so show us that tonight, Lord. And it's in your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. All right, so let's start by looking at verse 24. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross to follow me. 
Now, we have to examine this the way that they would have thought about this. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Can we get it? The amen? There we go. All right. All right. So starting. Yeah, Alice. <laughs> All right. So now we must think about this the way that the disciples would have thought about this when they first heard this. Okay. Because a lot of us, when we think of a cross, we think of a piece of jewelry. Right? We think of a piece of jewelry we wear to signify that we're Christians. Or if you look at Alice, Alice is quadruple crossed up with her earrings tonight. We think of it as something to show our Christianity. And we, we lose sight of the fact that it was literally the way that the government would execute people. So what's our equivalent? An electric chair or a lethal injection. So the equivalent of a cross for them would have been the equivalent of us, an electric chair. And also, you got to remember, Jesus has just started to tell them that, like, yeah, I'm going to die. I have to go to Jerusalem to die. And maybe you remember from last week when Jesus says that, Peter says, no. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan, right? So they have just are starting to learn that Jesus is saying he's going to die. But they don't know how. They don't know how. And so they don't know the end of the story like you do. They don't know that Jesus is eventually going to be victorious over the cross like you do. So just take a moment just to think about what it would have been like for them to hear this. It's basically saying, would you go to the electric chair for me? Verse 25, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. See, if you try to preserve your life, you will lose it. To have true life the only life that can be found, the only true life, you have to find it in Christ. You must be willing to give up your life. In verse 26, for what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? For what will anyone give in exchange for his life? See, this verse is the very heart of this message. What would it benefit someone if he gained the whole world but loses his life, loses his soul? What would they actually gain if it cost them their soul? What can somebody give to get their life to be redeemed? And there's actually a psalm that talks about this idea. Psalm 49, starting in verse 5, it says, Why should I fear in times of trouble? The iniquity of my foes surrounds me. They trust in their wealth and boast of their abundant riches. Yet these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God, since the price of redeeming him is too costly. One should forever stop trying, so that he may live forever and not see the pit. And the psalmist is saying material riches cannot redeem a person. Material riches cannot save your life. It cannot be a ransom to God. And so the psalmist says you shouldn't even try, because if that's your path, you're going to end up in the pit. And what's the pit? hell. So this psalm is saying that these people cannot redeem themselves or pay their ransom to God. So how can somebody be redeemed by giving their life to the Lord? And when you give it up is when you will find it. Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. What Jesus is talking about here is the day of judgment. One day, everyone will be held accountable. Those who are in Christ will be rewarded for what they've done, and those who have lived in their flesh will go to the pit. Every evil deed will be punished. Yet here's the scandal of grace. For us who are in Christ, our evil deeds were punished in the person of Jesus on the cross. It's already been done. See, so often, people talk about justice today, but they have a really twisted view of justice. And so you, you probably have heard a lot of talk about social justice, right? And social justice is completely foreign to biblical justice. Um, and let, let's give an example. See, social justice, by and large, is virtue signaling. I'm trying to say that you're a better person than you are. So let's give an example. Here's an example of what people will talk about with social justice. 
Somebody who's wanting to promote social justice will say something like, um, we should give back the land that at one point in time belonged to the Native Americans because it was taken from them, because it was conquered from them, or whatever. So justice would be to give it back to them. So whatever land your parents own, whatever land you live on, we should really give it back to them, and that would be justice. But here's the thing, that's not justice. Because let me ask you, did you steal the land? How much land have you stolen? Zero. So would it be justice for you to have to face that punishment? No. That's not justice at all, actually. And then think about it. Like, who do you even give it back to? Do you give it to the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Kiowa? Who do you give it back to? Because they're also all taking it from each other, too. That's, that's why they're warring tribes. So who do you give it back to? See, this is the problem, is you didn't, you didn't steal anybody's land. Nobody here stole anybody's land. So that wouldn't be justice to do that. So here's the thing. Justice means getting what you deserve. If you did steal somebody's land, you should probably give it back to them. But real quick, raise your hand if that's you. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. See, but here's the thing. The Bible teaches that what we deserve for our sin is what? Death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Justice for us would be death. But the Bible also talks about mercy. And mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. So picture this. Imagine I'm speeding, as I do, and I get pulled over, and a cop gives me a ticket. What's that? Justice. That's justice. I broke a law, and I have to face the punishment. Yeah. How much is the ticket? The ticket would be like 200 bucks. Tickets are crazy. All right. Imagine I speed, I get pulled over, and the cop says... I'm going to let you off with a warning. What's that? That's mercy. That's mercy. He did not give me what I deserved. All right, think about this. Imagine I speed, I get caught, I get pulled over, the cop gives me a ticket, but then the cop pays the ticket. What's that? That's grace. And that's what the Bible teaches, is the wages of your sin is death. And that is the penalty Jesus takes upon himself for you. This is like, for grace to be grace, you have to understand this. For grace to be grace, like we sang about in that song, it has to be free. It has to be undeserved. Nobody in this room is owed grace. For grace to be grace, it has to be truly free and undeserved. A gift, just like we read about in this verse. All right, verse 28. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, this is a tricky verse. This is a tricky verse to understand. What does it mean, will not taste death, till they see the Son of Man coming? It could be talking about the very end, okay? It could be talking about end times. The problem with that idea is the disciples are all dead now, right? Does this make sense to you? And there was this rumor, apparently, that John was never going to die. But John himself dispelled this rumor. John 21, 23. So this rumor spread to the brothers and sisters that this disciple would not die. He's talking about himself. Yet Jesus did not tell him that he would not die. But if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? So John kills these rumors himself. So are the disciples today dead or alive? Dead. dead. Okay. So it can't be that one. So then what's this verse talking about? Well, it could be talking about the transfiguration, which we'll talk about next week. But this only happens a week apart. And you think about it, so, but none of the disciples had died in between this and that. And to, so 
so why does it say some may not taste death? Because that implies what? If, if some may not taste death, what does that imply? Yeah, some people are going to die, right? So why even make that distinction? So, and the transfiguration happens like two weeks from now. So why would you even say that, right? Um, so what I think this is probably talking about is one of these two views. Um, I think it could be talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, what year are we when we are reading this passage in Matthew? Does anybody know what year this is? That these events are? It's probably 32 or 33 AD. So 40 years from now, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Basically, all of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The Jews are going to be killed. Judaism, as we know it, is going to be totally wiped out. And that could be what Jesus is talking about, because Jesus had prophesied about that. And so some of the disciples were still alive to see that. And, they, and so that might be what Jesus is talking about, is seeing that come true. Or the other thing this verse could be talking about is it could be talking about the apostolic age where the disciples went out and preached the kingdom of God after Jesus returned to heaven. And seeing the kingdom of God could be the idea of like more and more people joining the church. And the disciples die off one by one. So they all get to see different levels of the advancement of the kingdom. And they're all martyred, maybe besides John. So I think either one of the last two ideas is correct. So think about this. Exclude Judas, who Jesus later says was never really one of them. All the disciples suffer on their belief in Christ. And some of these guys literally die on a cross for believing in Christ. You know, there's an interesting story of a guy named Charles Coulson. And Coulson was an atheist. And it was part of the 1970s political scandal, Watergate. Does anybody know what Watergate was? You just learned about this. Okay. All right. What is it? What is it? Exactly. So, so um, Nixon was a Republican. And what happened, what Watergate was, is these Republicans broke into the Democratic National committee to try to get info, right? And so eventually Nixon resigns over it. He's the only president ever to resign presidency. So here's the thing. Here's where Colson comes in. Colson is part of this conspiracy, and he's part of the cover-up, and he goes to jail for it. And he says one day, he's like, here's how I know the Bible is true. He said, there were 12 people involved in the Watergate scandal. He said, in three weeks, each one of them cracked. After three weeks of pressure, each one of them cracked and told the truth. And they all went to jail. He said, for the disciples, there's 12 disciples. And for 30 years, they tell the same story under intense persecution. Not one of them changes the story. Not one of them recants. And they all die for it. So he said, I have been in this movie. I have seen this happen. And so he became a Christian because he said, I have seen this happen. These guys would only do this if it was the truth. Now, with that in mind, the whole idea of this text is that discipleship costs everything. Everything. So again, imagine, you're sitting down, you're talking to Jesus, and Jesus asks you, would you be willing to go to an electric chair and die for me? And what's your answer? See, being a disciple means that you live for Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 7, For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. To be a disciple means you live for Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 15, And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Is that you? Are you living for yourself, or are you living for Christ? In Galatians 2.20, this is Paul talking, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the thing, guys. Is that you? Have you crucified your flesh? 
Have you died to yourself? And are, is it Christ living in you? And so why does this matter to you? What impact does this make on your life? How does this affect you? Well, think about this. The call is to give up our life. Yet we don't even want to give up the things of the world. We're supposed to be willing to give up our life for Christ to the point of death. But some of us aren't even willing to give up the things of the world. We can, and here's what that means. You care more about what your friends think about you than you care about what Jesus thinks about you. You got to let that go. Or you care more about consuming media that you want to consume that's worldly than consuming media that glorifies God. And here's the dangerous thing. Some people think, well, someday I'll take the Jesus thing seriously. Someday when I'm older. Right now, I want to wild out a little bit. I want to live my life. You've heard this. You've all heard people say this. Someday later, I'll figure this out and I'll do all that stuff. But you can't live that way. You know, Jesus actually gives a warning to people about this. In Luke 12, starting in verse 16, this is a parable about this very situation. So then he told them this parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? And that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What that story is saying is that God comes to this guy who says, oh, I'll figure it out in the, later. I'll start taking my faith seriously later. And God comes to him and says, you fool. Tonight's your last night. And all those earthly things you've stored up, all those material things you've stored up, whose will they be now that you're gone? You don't know when your last night is. So don't waste your life on earthly things. Focus on eternal things. Number two, be a dedicated disciple. And how can we be dedicated disciples? By following God's word and living in accordance to him. You're going to have a really hard time being a dedicated disciple, though, if you don't even know what the Bible says. You're going to have a hard time with this if you don't read the Bible. So you have to be in the Bible. You have to be in church and do the things a Christian does. Actually put your faith in action, as James talks about. And lastly, this is the whole idea of this passage. Die now so you don't die forever. Die now so you don't die forever. Die to the world. Die to your flesh. And if you don't, then you will die forever in the pit. See, Jesus is asking his followers, are you willing to die for me? And I pray for your sake that your answer is yes. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we pray that you would help us to be brave and bold in our belief in your lordship. And help us to be dedicated disciples, Lord. Give us the strength you gave the apostles. Give us the strength to be willing to die on your behalf, Lord. And help us to find the true life that only you can provide. Let us find true life tonight. And everybody said, amen.